Welcome to the Just Ingredients Podcast. I'm Cara Lynn, and here we talk all things nourishing to the mind, body, and soul. This is a place where you can find just good ingredients to life. Brandless offers premium wellness, clean beauty, personal care, and home goods that are affordable for everyone. They prioritize offering products that match people's values, preferences, and requirements, whether that be organic, keto, or vegan wellness products to non-toxic cleaning supplies or cruelty-free and clean personal care products. They support clean living by promising to never use 400 harmful ingredients often found in beauty products. Right now, enjoy all of their products at 15% off, including their new organic home decor line and some of my favorite kitchen products, unbleached parchment paper and stainless steel bakeware. Use code JUST15 for 15% off. That code again is JUST15 for 15% off all products except the brandless bundles. Remember, brandless, live more for less. Dr. Natasha Beck is a parenting expert and founder of Dr. Organic Mommy, an online resource focused on pregnancy, parenting, and non-toxic living. With over 56,000 loyal and engaged followers who look to her for real-world advice on raising children, Natasha is now known as Dr. Organic Mommy. Dr. Beck holds a doctorate in clinical psychology specializing in pediatric neuropsychology and a master's in public health, specializing in child and family health. She is also certified in leadership education in neurodevelopment disabilities from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Dr. Beck is currently pregnant with her fourth child. From how to handle tantrums to mealtime difficulties to helping families live healthier lives, Dr. Organic Mommy aims to help every family make healthy decisions, drawing on her experience as a mom and parenting expert. Her parenting expertise combines the use of Waldorf, Montessori, and RIE philosophies tied into cognitive, behavioral, and play therapy. All proceeds from the Dr. Organic Mommy website go directly to charity, including all sponsored posts and affiliate codes. In addition to her very popular Instagram channel at Dr. Organic Mommy, Dr. Beck has been named one of the top 100 health and wellness influencers in 2020 by the New Hope Network. I am so excited to have Dr. Natasha Beck with me today. I follow her on Instagram. She is Dr. Organic Mommy on Instagram. Thank you so much for taking your time to be here today. Of course, I'm so happy to do it. I'm so excited to talk to you about children and issues with children, things like that. First, tell my followers just a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you started studying or why you started studying pediatric neuropsychology? So um, born and raised in Los Angeles, married to my high school sweetheart who I've known since I was two years old, have three kids, one on the way and two dogs. And when I was a child, I was diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD, dyslexia now known as reading disorder, which kind of got me very interested in neuropsychology and the process of it and how limited and how There was so many obstacles and limited access to people to be able to get tested. And so I ended up studying neuroscience and psychology in uh, college. Not sure if I wanted to do medical school, a PhD in neuroscience, PhD in psychology, Um, but I ended up doing my doctorate in clinical psychology, specializing in pediatric neuropsychology, which basically means I'm testing kids across a number of different modalities, looking at their visual perceptual skills, their verbal skills, their working memory, their um, social skills, their fine motor skills. And I kind of put that all together and figure out the puzzle for parents basically, and figure out what kind of accommodations um, these kids need. Oh, I love that you went into that field and are helping children and, and helping their parents. It's so needed. So I want to just talk to you about a lot of different toxins, I guess I'll call them, because on your Instagram site, you talk a lot about toxins and how they affect children. And of course, I talk a lot about that as well, but I love hearing it from your perspective, from a doctor's perspective. So let's start with sugar. That's a huge issue here in America. So why is sugar such a problem for children? 100%. Before I I think we jump into the toxins, I just want to preface it by saying social toxins can be worse than chemical ones. 
because the worrying and the being overwhelmed by it can be worse for you, the stress that it's causing. So I just want to preface this by saying this is information that we're sharing and just do one step at a time. And this is not to scare anybody. It's to make sure you're properly informed and to do the best that you can. Oh, I love that you said that because it can be very overwhelming, which then becomes scary. And we don't want that at all. We're just informing parents. Being a parent is hard enough. It um, is very hard. I will, yeah. We can both say that. Um, so sugar. I think the problem with sugar is we used to have two kinds of sugar. Sugar cane and sugar that came from beets. And now there's hundreds of different kinds of sugar. You know, we've got the high fructose corn syrup that is so much, has a higher proportion of fructose than your typical regular sugar that comes from cane sugar. Your fruit concentrate, these things are found in so many products and especially things targeted for kids. And more and more kids are having so much sugar added to their diet. I mean, a 2010 study found that almost 9% of a child's total calorie intake from ages 12 to 24 months, that we're talking a one to two year old, comes from sugar. 90%? My, almost 9%. That's a oh. lot. Considering that they don't want any sugar in a child's diet, added sugar, under 24 months. Gotcha. American Academy of Pediatrics does not want added sugar to your child's diet under the age of two. And after the age of two, they say no more than six teaspoons or 25 grams. But you're getting that in your breakfast alone. Think about your typical child's breakfast. You've got your bowl of cereal. So maybe you've got like your fruit loops or your lucky charms. You've got a carton of 100% fruit juice and maybe even a morning blueberry muffin. Let's think about what kind of sugar is in that. So if you're having a cup of cereal, like the fruit loops, it's at least 12, 13 grams of sugar. You've got your carton of fruit juice that's at least six to 12 grams of sugar. You're, you're already past your limit for the day. For your child and you haven't even gotten to the blueberry muffin so just think about that that you haven't had snack you haven't had lunch you haven't had your afternoon snack and you haven't had dinner and you've so, already passed your amount for the day yeah. and think about what that's doing to your child's brain your child's body you that know and then ultimately their relationship with their teachers their ability to focus their ability to think their relationship with you their ability to process things yeah, that is crazy. I always suggest to parents, let's focus on protein and healthy fats in the morning because that's what's going to give them a better start for the day. Yes, or get some complex carbs in there, you know, which is why I love oatmeal and get, you know, the organic oats when you can um, and add all those fun toppings to it or even a smoothie. Get your, you know, frozen banana, throw in another, you know, frozen fruit, add in some veggies get some cashew butter, which tends to be really bland and no one tastes it, you know, add in some freshly ground flax um, when you can. If the kid still wants something a little bit sweeter, touch maple syrup, a little bit of honey is fine, but that's a better breakfast than your cereal because it's got all the fiber, it's got all the nutrients in there and it's gonna fill your child up. Definitely. So imagine the accumulation of sugar that you're getting throughout the day is so much more and it's having adverse impacts on our children's health. And what are those adverse health outcomes? I mean, everything from hyperactivity to having difficulty concentrating to learning challenges, to obesity, to heart issues, to even to Alzheimer's. I mean, they're finding studies now that like people who have had so much sugar exposure are breaking down something called um, the microphage mitigation factor that's found in glial cells that are actually present when you, uh, in your brain and they break down and you don't have as many when you have Alzheimer's disease and it's because of the exposure of sugar. So what's happening when we expose sugar, so our brains to sugar when we're so young and companies and, and unfortunately are just targeting our kids, you know, with everything that has sugar and we're st even in formula there's added sugar right you know all of the, the teething biscuits all of those like little kid snacks there's sugar in all of that you know i mean you're having so much that it's just and it's impacting the gut we're wondering why you know we don't have any good healthy bacteria in our gut we have too much sugar we need sugar but not the amount that we're getting today 
So do you see sugar as a problem with your clients? Yes, 100%. That's something that I don't think a lot of people take into account is not just, you know, diet, but our environmental toxins. But I mean, kids are coming in when I'm, when I've tested them and they've got 30, 40 grams of sugar sitting in front of them of added sugar in their food that they bring in when they're getting tested. And you wonder, well, what's going on there? How's that going to impact my test and my ability to test them today? You know, I mean, you can ask teachers the day that teachers hate the most, the day after Halloween, they're all on a sugar high. Oh, the sugar high. They can't teach them. You know, it's, it's impossible. So what do you suggest to parents to lower that sugar intake? I think you have to be mindful of it because you can't just go and restrict because you have to think about, well, why are you so impacted by sugar personally as an adult? Were you told you couldn't have sugar or were you given unlimited amounts? So first you have to think about how you're projecting your thoughts on sugar onto your children. Secondly, you have to think about well, I'm not going to be able to control my child all the time and you can't stop them from having sugar. So what can you do? You can educate them and talk to them about the impact of sugar and get them to learn how to pay attention to their body. You want them to learn how they feel after eating certain things. And the difference between having a fruit juice box versus having a piece of fruit, it slows down the amount of insulin that we're having. And we're not having this huge spike, which ends up leading to diabetes, which now more and more kids have. And that's what we should, side note, we should be really talking about during this pandemic is how to educate people on getting, cleaning up their diet because they're more at risk for so many things. But we've got to teach our kids, number one, about added sugar and where the unrefined sugar is coming from. You know, we want to have a whole piece of fruit. We want to have our honey, our maple syrup, and look at your ingredients, you know, just like you teach your audience every day to look at the ingredients. You know, it just takes two seconds to flip over to see what's in your products. And so when you start to teach your kids that at an early age, they pick up on it and they're like, whoa, what is that? I, I can't even pronounce that. I don't even know what that is. And so they start to become more attuned to that as well as to how they feel. When they have a stomach ache, let them realize the impact of what they eat after they have a birthday party or they go and they have like unlimited amounts of sugar, let them know how it feels and have a conversation with them. Well, and I always tell parents also to watch the hidden sugars because that's a really easy way to lower the sugar in people's diets. For instance, like applesauce, it doesn't need added sugar, but so many of them have added sugar or even spaghetti sauce, marinara sauce, doesn't need added sugar, but so many of them do. And so If people, like you said, will just turn the label around and just read really quick and find the The one that doesn't have the added sugar. As an an added sugar section. So if you see that, put it away. Exactly. So educate our kids and as parents also do our part by reading the labels. Okay, let's move on to another toxin. Let's talk about artificial dyes. Artificial dyes are really common in children's foods, again, just like the sugar, What are exactly artificial dyes for those that are new? And then why are they such a problem for children? So artificial dyes are chemical substances that are synthesized. They used to be from tar, but now it's petroleum, petroleum that's found in fuel and gasoline. And so the problem is, is that they were used to enhance the color of food. Why? Because they want our children and people to be more excited about our food. When things are more vibrant, you're more attracted to it. And the problem is, if you actually look at, per, at artificial dyes, they're in everything, and especially kids' food. And why? Because if you get those kids addicted to it in the beginning, they're gonna keep wanting to go back to it. And that's the problem. With artificial dyes, the harm that they're having was even detected as early as in the 1970s. A pediatric, I think it was an allergist, found that there was some kind of correlation with kids eating artificial dyes and having attentional problems, known as ADHD. And when now studies, multiple studies, study after study have found that when you remove not only artificial dyes, but preservatives, they actually can lower the amount of attentional symptoms and difficulty concentrating in kids. And I even found that when I was testing kids, when I worked with them, 
if we actually just change their diet and take those things out, and I know from personal experience as well, when I remove them from my diet, it makes a huge difference. And now there's some kids, yes, that very much have ADHD. I'm one of them. My husband is one of them for sure. But there are some kids that actually don't have the disorder. They're just being impacted by their diet, their environment. And so when you remove those things, you'll see it, you know, and even just a decrease in those symptoms will make a huge difference. Okay. So with talking about these dyes, do you see a correlation between children's tantrums and artificial dyes? 100%. Obviously all of our kids are going to tantrum and it's normal. And I want your kids to tantrum because tantrums are teaching moments, not only for your child, but also for yourself. But when you see the increased amount of tantrums where they're just breaking down and you're thinking, why is my child having so much, so many behavioral challenges? Think about what they're eating. Those artificial dyes are really impacting them. You know, it can cause them to feel not in control. They have, they're more impulsive. A child, their frontal lobe is not developed until almost their early 20s. Your frontal lobe is what's responsible for your executive decision-making, your your impulsivity. And it's not there in kids and you're just adding more to it. And so they're gonna be even more impulsive, more emotional, more dysregulated when you add these artificial dyes to their system because it's just accumulating so much in them. Well, that's so interesting because artificial dyes add to tantrums, but I know high sugar amounts add to tantrums. So if you've got both of them going on, we have a problem. 100%. And so I think you just have to take a step back and think, okay, what's going on here with my kid? If you see no utter reason for the increased amount in tantrums and the breakdowns that they're having, look at their diet. That's one place to start. I learned that early on, actually, with my children, when they were having tantrums, I always asked, when was the last time they've eaten? And two, what was the last thing that they ate? Because it usually happened after some sugary treat or snack, or they were hungry. Yes, 100%. Those are great questions to ask. So, okay, let's move on from tantrums. Do artificial dyes affect children's sleep? Yeah. So when you combine sugar and artificial dyes, yes, they can affect sleep. So I have so many parents coming to me and my kid just won't go to sleep. Now there's a lot of things that could be, you know, under what's going on with why your kid's not sleeping from, you know, fears to, you know, common developmental milestones, but their diet impacts their sleep, you know, and people don't think about that if you're so raced up and hyped up on sugar and these dyes are actually causing changes in you, in your brain, you're not going to be able to sleep. So it's no wonder our kids can't get to sleep, can't stay asleep, and then end up having problems the next day. Because when you're tired, you can't function. At least for me, I know I can't function. I'm not as patient when I'm sleepy. Right. And sleep is so important to just repair and to detox and things like that to get the body ready for the next day. 100% kids need that, you know, little kids, you know, younger kids, the early childhood, they need that 12 hours of sleep. Well, and melatonin has become so popular these days for parents. And I want to say that's sort of just a band-aid to the problem. Let's figure out the root cause. Is it too much sugar during the day? Too many artificial dyes? Is it a lack of magnesium? Things like this. So thank you for sharing that. 100%. And there's so many things that could be contributing to sleep, you know, even screen time. So like, you just got to go through your checklist of figuring out what's the root cause, like you said, instead of just having that bandaid fix, which I think most people in America just come to do. Oh, that's interesting. So do you think some colors of dyes are worse than others? So the there's six food dyes most commonly found. There's three that make up 90% of the food dyes on the market. There's red 40, which is banned in most places, including the UK and other parts of Europe. Um, And then yellow six and and yellow five. And they are found in everything that you wouldn't even think of, you know, from salad dressing to, you know, milk to- uh, To marshmallows. I I was shocked when I saw them in marshmallows. Right, they're in everything, your kids' gummies. You know, like you've got them right there. Like you're having them right there in the morning. Your kids' cereal products, 
They're found in pickles. They're found in smoked salmon. Artificial dyes are added to everything to make things more interesting because our food has been so tortured over the years that it's no longer really as edible. Okay, if a parent has a child with ADHD, do you suggest that they just avoid all the artificial dyes or do you tell them just a certain color? What's your suggestion for them? Actually, I think for all kids, not just kids for ADHD, but especially kids with ADHD to remove all artificial dyes. There are dyes out there and luckily more and more companies are showing people and adding things that are better for you. And they're using more natural plant-based dyes, things that come from food like, you know, avocado dye. There's, uh, you know, from beets, from, you know, spirulina, there's, they're, they're naturally found in our foods, colors everywhere, you know? And so, yes, I very much recommend to remove those. And, you know, even with your candy, when you find that you're giving your kids candy, there's candies out there now that have no artificial dyes in them. So 100%, I teach my kids, does is this have artificial dye? And they know that, you know? And so that's what I want you to teach your kids. So when they get older, they'll start to become more aware and they can make those decisions as they get older. But your hope is that you provided that foundation for them early on. So if someone's listening right now and they're like, oh goodness, my house is full of artificial dyes. What's your suggestion for them? Should they just go in and remove everything? Or like you said, from the beginning, one little thing at a time, what's your suggestion? I think it depends on the person. Very much so. Some people are very like, all right, we're going to go cold turkey. We're going to remove everything. Some, it's just too hard to do that because it's just too overwhelming. So for most people, I think it's too overwhelming. So start with your breakfast foods. You know, I think breakfast foods commonly have food dyes, commonly have added sugar. So let's think about how we start the day with our kids. See if you see an impact, you know, and not only with your kids, but you have to do it yourself because kids model kids watch everything you do. And if you're not eating correctly, you're not eating the same things that you're giving your children, or you're wanting them to eat, they're not going to eat it. So start with your breakfast foods. And if that's even too overwhelming, start with one day a week, see if you notice a difference, get some oatmeal in there. You know, I, I love to add grated zucchini and grated carrots into the kids oatmeal, which is naturally sweet from the carrots, add a little maple syrup, get some, you know, ground flat, freshly ground flax some chia seeds and Top it with a little almond butter, frozen wild blueberries, and it's and then the blueberries naturally turn your milk purple, so it's a purple kind of cereal, or even some scrambled eggs if you you know you eat eggs, and see how your child does in the beginning of the day, see how they feel, and test it out. Okay, that's a great suggestion. Can we move to another toxin? Yeah. Okay, let's do the next one. One that is really confusing, at least I find for my followers are PFOAs or PFASs because those initials and you'll see PFTE, you'll see all these different initials out there when looking for pots and pans and, you know, and you hear about it on the news or in our water and it's just really confusing to people. So what are PFOAs and where are they found? Yes. So great question. It's very overwhelming. So PFOS is known as per or polyfluoral alkyl substances. They are a human made substance that was found to be very durable and heat resistant. And unfortunately they're known also as a forever chemical because they don't break down. And those are the PFASs or yes. PFAS. And there are thousands of them, unfortunately. The two common ones are the ones you listed are your PFOAs and your PFOS. And so, and then there's new ones coming out, your Gen X and there's so many of them and there's derivatives of them because some of them are starting to be banned in America, but then they come from other countries on our products that we import and we're not monitoring that. So yes, the most common place you find them, yes, are your pots and your pants, that nonstick, anything that claims to be nonstick, that's just not possible, unfortunately. And I know it stinks because you're like, oh, I don't want to just clean another thing, but when you're cooking, you want to think to yourself, you're getting an accumulated exposure to this over time. And a documentary that I love and I always recommend to people to watch is The Devil We Know. It's actually really interesting and um, they do a great job. Some documentaries can be boring, um, but they do a great job of explaining this. 
and the harmful impacts it's not only having on adults, but on children. You know, children are much smaller and they're not able to handle it. And they're even finding it in the umbilical cord of babies, which is why we found that it's a forever chemical. Babies who haven't even entered the world have it in their system because they're getting it from the parent or the person who, who carried them, their mother. And so that's the problem. And why is it a problem? I think is the big question. What is it doing? It's impacting our hormones. It's impacting our immune system. It's having liver damage, kidney damage. I mean, there are even possible correlations with low birth weight, with you know thyroid problems. And so you wonder when we're adding all of this up, we're just listing through these toxins. We wonder why there's an increase in ADHD. There's an increase in kids on the autism spectrum. There's an increase in kids who have you know, immune problems and autoimmune problems and obesity. This is all adding up and what's going on and it's in our environment and what we're doing. And unfortunately, these PFOS chemicals are not just found in cookware. They're found in everything from our floss to water, to our clothes, some of our clothing even. So, and how do you know? Because they don't always list it, you know? Oh, it's not going to say this has PFOS in it. So anything that could be water resistant or stain resistant, anything that says those two things or nonstick, those three things, avoid those. Nonstick, water resistant, stain resistant. That means it's got one of these PFOS chemicals in them. So avoid that. And anything that says DWR, the durable water resistant in those, like your kids' lunch bags. So try to find ones that don't have that because the problem is, yes, it's not, you're not ingesting it. So what's the problem? It releases into our air is the problem. And so that dust, you don't realize it. If, if you ever see like a shining light from the sun in your room, and then all of a sudden you see all those little speckles, that's dust. And you don't see that you're just breathing that in. So how do you avoid it? Dusting with wet mopping, vacuuming getting a high quality air filter, opening the windows when the air quality is good outside as well. I know a lot of people get overwhelmed with this one. And so the two main things I tell people to start with are pots and pans, like you said. So use stainless steel or glass, cast iron, things like that. Uh, the second is a water filter. I'll get a lot of time from listeners that will say, well, I didn't have a water filter growing up. And I'm like, well, our water has a lot more of the PFAS is than they did back in our time. Like we just have created so many of these now and they're just lasting forever, like you said. And so now it's a concern in our water. So a really easy way is to just get a water filter. Water filter and cookware are the best place to start. And, you know, you have to realize when people say, oh, what? but I had those things when I was a kid. I ate those things. Unfortunately, we have more autoimmune conditions in people our age now than we ever did before. I mean, it's about almost 60% of people who have some kind of autoimmune condition. That's a huge number. Right. Think about, well, where did that come from? Where are all these increases and in all these diseases and conditions coming from? It's from when we grew up, 70s, 80s, you know, they had all that damage there. And so we just, and we accumulated all of that. So I, I know I always try to stop that argument. Well, I ate it and I was fine. Right. You know? Not, not the best scientific evidence for it. Okay, so PFOAs have been banned in America just recently. So I always tell people it's sort of a marketing scam. When you see these pots and pans like at Target and they say PFOAs free, I'm like, that's a marketing scam. It's been banned. What you need to look for is the PFAS free, correct? Correct, because there are thousands of PFAS um, your polyfluoral alkyl substances and your perfluoral alkyl substances, thousands of them. And so there's lots of derivatives. So that's why you just have to avoid like those, exactly what you said, the marketing scams of like, oh, this is free of those toxic chemicals that are banned here, but they just made another derivative of it and put that in instead. I think I last read that there were 3000 PFASs and PFOA is just one of the 3000. 100%. So everybody listening, don't be confused. Just look on your label for PFAS free. Yes. I think I, ha I actually haven't even seen that. I mean, maybe you have, but I, I haven't even seen a PFAS free label. 
but that's why I stick with like avoid anything that says nonstick stain resistant or water resistant. Yeah. They're coming. I've seen a few. So some companies are getting better. So let's hope it just keeps getting better from here. Okay, let's talk about the next toxin that is actually very common today, BPA. What does BPA stand for? What are they and where are they found? So BPA is bisphenol A, and there are lots of different kinds of bisphenols. So just like we were talking about, Things that say a bit, well, let's go back. Bisphenols are found in polycarbonate plastics and in epoxy resins. So what does that mean? You got your food containers, your cans, anything that's got a hard plastic. Bisphenols make it easy to mold and manipulate. And then it it holds things into the can, right? And so people now are saying, well, let's just get rid of BPA. Luckily, the American Academy of Pediatrics has said, get rid of BPA because we found how harmful it is to our kids uh, because they are endocrine disruptors, meaning that BPA imitate um, our body's hormones and, and they interfere with the production of hormones. And so we wonder, well, why are kids having such early puberty? Why are they, I, I've got parents asking me for deodorant recommendations for their six-year-olds, their seven-year-olds. I mean, I don't know about you, Carolyn, but I don't remember putting deodorant on until I was about 12 right. or 13. So things are changing and it's because of what's in our environment. Now, yes, you can get something that is BPA free, but again, they replace it with something that is equally harmful or not, if not more harmful, something with BPS, BPF. They just keep coming out with more derivatives of it. And so what do you do? Right. What do you do? That's what the listeners are thinking. Well, okay, now I'm overwhelmed. When you can remove plastic, so plastic water bottles, food containers that have plastic, because the problem is, is that the bisphenols that are found in plastic and the in the epoxy resins that are found in cans, it causes the bisphenols to leach into your food. And so you're actually consuming it. You're digesting that and taking that into your body, which is the problem. And you're finding they, they find high levels of bisphenols, especially in kids, which is why the American Academy of Pediatrics first came out in 2012 saying, hmm, let's be cautious of plastic. And then in 2018, they finally said, avoid plastic when possible, especially do not heat it up. Don't put it in your dishwasher. Use glass and stainless steel for kids. That's interesting. Well, and it's a really easy solution, I think, or an easy problem to fix in your home because there's so many stainless steel water bottles out there now. There are so many glass food storage containers out there. So it's just being aware and educated of the issue so that you can make that easy little swap in your life. Exactly. When you find that your plastic containers are a little warped, instead of buying a new plastic one, invest in the glass one, and those are going to actually last you longer. Okay, I have a question though about BPA in cans because a lot of people do buy canned food and for some people it might not be possible not to buy the canned food. So what's your suggestion there? You can't avoid cans. I mean, I use cans too, you know, and no one is perfect. So when you can try to find things that are BPA free, yes, but also find things that are in cans that are not acidic. Things that are acidic tend to cause bisphenols to leach into the food. So your tomato sauces, when you can try and find that in glass. I know that's hard. So heat and and acidity. Like I usually buy my canned coconut cream because I use coconut milk and coconut cream for everything. Um, And your canned like pumpkin puree for like Thanksgiving and like everything. I use those. So just try to be mindful of like, if there's two options, try to go with the glass. If there's not, try to avoid this that are acidic. Um, And if you can't, your body does have natural detox systems in it. That's why you have a liver. Right. (laughs) You you can naturally detox it. You just want to think about, all right, when I can try to avoid it. We cannot avoid all of these toxins, but we can reduce the intake that we take in. And so that's just the whole purpose of learning all of this is reduce where you can. So a really easy one that I found was I used to buy a ton of like canned corn and canned peas. And I was like, oh, that's so easy to buy in the frozen section. I'll just buy the frozen corn, the frozen peas, you know, things like that. So that's an easy swap as well. Preservatives as well, which you're wanting to avoid. Right. 
you know, it doesn't have the sodium benzoate or all the benzenes that people are now concerned with. They're, they're concerned with it in sunblock, but benzenes, those are preservatives that are found in our food. Oh, goodness. <laughs> One more thing to worry about. Avoid things with preservatives like, you know, so exactly your point. Frozen foods, they don't have the preservatives in there. So another question about BPA I hear, well, I see on Instagram, a lot of people talking about BPA in children's toys. For me as a mom, that's a really hard one to avoid because you want to buy toys for your kids and everybody's claiming they're all full of BPA. So what's your suggestion for that? That's definitely a hard one. Um, I'm of the mindset too, that we don't need as many toys as we do, as we think we do for our kids. It used to be before the industrial revolution, there was no socioeconomic status gap between toys. There wasn't like, oh, well, if you had more money, you know, and you were the upper class, like you got to have all these beautiful toys. Kids of all backgrounds had the same toys. And it was what was in their environment, you know, like my kids use paper and they rip it up and they play you know, they use it as tickets or money, or they rip it up and they're like, oh, this is my food that I've been putting into a basket. Now, obviously that's not going to work for everybody. So what do you do? There are now toy companies that are making things out of wood, you know, out of fabric. Those are the things I look for. And honestly, they last longer because a lot of those plastic toys, they come with all those little pieces or parts and you always end up losing them. And then you can't find them. And then you end up buying it again. And then when you do have some of these plastic toys, they have one purpose to them too. The kids play with them for a day or two, and then they're done. So try to find those more purposeful toys that have multi-purpose to them that are made from wood, made of fabric, felt, scarves, wooden blocks. Those are the ones you want to try and stick with when possible. There are a lot of new toys coming out, like you said, because the other day we have a ton of plastic building blocks from years ago. And my friends were like, oh, look at these new cardboard ones they have. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So there's a lot more out there, you know, I think. And it, the problem is, is like doing that research is, is right. overwhelming. Trying to find it, you know, which is part of why I started, you know, my platform is to provide that research for people that in an unbiased way. So we've talked about glass being a great alternative to BPA products. And then like you said, the wood and the fabric for toys. But what about silicone? Is that a better option than BPA? Yes, I like silicone. There's pros and cons to it. The cons, it it's not as sustainable, for sure. Like it doesn't break down. Um, but you're not, you know, constantly buying like tons of Ziploc bags if you replace them with silicone bags. With silicone, the thing that they don't know yet is does heat, extreme heat impact silicone? Does it break down? Does it leach? So I use silicone for refrigeration and for my freezer. And I think silicone is fine in that way. So just be mindful of using, yes, silicone is a great option. And I think you can use it in your fridge and your freezer. So another question about toxins are flame retardants. And this seems to be really popular with the new moms. I have a niece who's having a baby and she called the other day and was like, Have you seen all the new strollers and car seats and all these baby items that now claim they're flame retardant? Is this something I should be looking for? And so are flame retardants something that people should be cautious about now on their products? Unfortunately, yes. So flame retardants are are chemicals that prevent or slow down the start of fires. But the problem is, is that they impact your hormones and they can even cause cancer. Um, and they bioaccumulate in you when you're breathing them in. So they're found in your car seats, your strollers, your pajamas. Pajamas just shocks me because I'm like, why is it in your pajamas? Like, <laughs> right. Like, how is that going to prevent the fire? Like close your kid's door. That's the best you know, prevention. But um, so that one just always shocks me. So yes, you want to try and look for the flame retardant free options. And they're coming out with those things that are, have cotton and, and wool. Those are things you want to look for. Avoid the things with the polyurethane foam. Those, you know, or if it just says flame retardant free. And then you can go one step further if you want and say like, okay, well, what's actually in it? And luckily, lots of companies are now doing that. Nuna, um, all of their um, car seats and everything since 2019, flame retardant free. Clec, 
flame retardant free. Um, Appa Baby was one of the first ones that came out with their Henry car seat model that was made mm. of wool that's flame retardant free, which is a very heavy car seat, but there's lots more options now. And then with your kids' pajamas, you're going to see like a yellow tag that's like kind of like a long rectangle. That's your indication, flame retardant free, that it's not on your kids' pajamas. Oh, that's good to know about the yellow rectangle. Okay, so if parents see that yellow rectangle, they know that's a good choice pajama to buy. Well, and with the car seats, my niece was saying, well, is this going to protect my child though? And I said, they're just using natural means like the wool, like you said, as the fire retardant rather than the synthetic man-made chemicals. Correct. I think that's important for people to know. They're still trying to protect the kids, but just using a natural means. Exactly. You can still do it. And I don't want parents to freak out if like, oh my goodness, my kid was in car seats with flame retardants. Yes. And like, I'm sure there was things that we've done, you know, we've had those exposures, but going forward, limit them. Now the kid's out of a car seat, get pajamas that have no flame retardants. Right. I always say, once you know better, do better. Because all of my kids were probably in flame retardant stuff because I had no idea years ago. I have a 21 year old, so I had no idea back then. Exactly. So are flame retardants considered an endocrine disruptor as well? Unfortunately, they are. And so when you add all these toxins up, a lot of them are endocrine disruptors. And, you know, this is why there's increased amounts of fertility issues. And, you know, even some predictions are coming out in by 2050 that we're going to have massive amounts of infertility. You know, it's a big problem. And it's because of these toxins that are endocrine disruptors. Right. So we've got the flame retardants, the BPAs, the PFASs, all of those are endocrine disruptors. Amongst my friends and family, there are so many people dealing with infertility and horrible PMS and migraines and just hormonal imbalance issues. And it's everywhere. And it's because it's everywhere in our food, our products, our air. So it's just important for us to know how we can reduce the exposure to them. 100%. And it is so overwhelming, but that's why, you know, I started my page. That's why you started your pages. So you can provide information and Instagram. Yeah, it's got its pros and cons to it, but at least you've got that access to information. You know, it takes a village to raise kids and we don't have that village anymore, but luckily that's one of the pros of Instagram is it provides you with that village. So if a listener is just starting, try to live a less toxic lifestyle and they've just heard all of this information, where would you suggest that they start? Well, the first things I always start with are air, food, and water, which does sound like a lot. When you're thinking about your air, indoor air quality can actually be worse than your outdoor. So when you can invest in a high quality air filtration system, then you're gonna start with your water. When you can invest in a water filtration system, the environmental working group has a great water database where you can type in your zip code and it will pop out the type of water filtration systems that are best for your area and given and it'll even show like you know this is the cheapest one but this will do some part of the job this is the more expensive one but it will do the job really well so utilize that the environmental working group is amazing they have so many different databases for everything you know, including your cleaning products, your beauty products as well. So definitely check that out. And then your food. I think people get really overwhelmed with, well, we should have organic food because organic, you know, means that, you know, it doesn't have all these artificial dyes or it doesn't have all these pesticides in it. My number one advice, stick to whole food ingredients. If you can't afford organic, that doesn't mean don't eat strawberries, Right. you know, bother you eat strawberries in a packaged food you know, of fake strawberries or like things that claim to have strawberry flavoring. Stick with whole food ingredients, actually eat a piece of fruit, eat the whole vegetable. And when you can look at your dirty dozen list that's on the EWG, that's the 12 top produce items that they find that hold on to pesticides the most. So when you can buy those things organic, and then they have something called the clean 15 that have are less likely to hold on to pesticides you know, like citrus, things that have a thicker peel, like avocados. So you can buy those more uh, conventionally grown. So I think start with that. And instead of buying the same thing over again, 
I say, let's think about if there's a better option. You know, don't go out and go, all right, we have to go make these changes right now. Run out of something or wait till something's a little messed up or destroyed a little bit. And then think about, all right, I'm going to buy something else in a better way to replace it. Okay, those are good suggestions. So I always end my podcast by asking my guests, what have they found to be the best ingredient in life? It's a great question. Um, I think for most people, everybody would just say happiness. But I think, well, what leads to happiness? My motto with parents is to tell them, it's not your job to make your kids happy. It's your job to make them or to help them learn how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because that has so many implications, you know? And your child can't be happy unless they know that there's gonna be discomfort in the world. And when you make some of these changes, I think you're gonna see some upset kids sometimes, but they're gonna have the, you you don't wanna focus on the short term of them being upset and saying, I don't wanna do this, you're a mean mommy or mean daddy or whoever. You're gonna focus on the long term that you're really helping your kids health. And eventually your hope is that 20 years down the line, they're going to say, thank you. I love that, that you need to teach your kids that uncomfort is okay. That being uncomfortable is okay. I actually don't know if I've taught my kids that. So maybe I need to reevaluate that topic in our home. But that is a good suggestion. I love that. Will you tell my guests where they can find you? Sure. So I have my Instagram, Dr. Organic Mommy, dr.organicmommy. I've got a website drorganicmommy.com. All of the proceeds from my page go to charity. Um, That's one of the reasons I started this is to have a place of information that's unbiased. You know, I don't accept any free products from people. I never accepted your deodorant or anything. And I love your deodorant, you know, And and I am trying to find products and do the research for people so they don't have to. And so it's there on my page which is so incredibly nice of you, and especially to donate that all to charity. You are a wonderful resource for people. And if you don't follow her yet, follow Dr. Organic Mommy, because you will learn a lot and learn about different companies, different products. And I love that you are a doctor just trying to help kids live a healthier, happier life, and that you're just trying to teach these parents how to help your kids when they're struggling because so many are and parents don't know exactly what to do. So thank you for being such an amazing resource. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for being a great resource too. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to the Just Ingredients podcast to learn more about your health and good ingredients to life. Plus get daily tips at just.ingredients on Instagram.